So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you from, for joining either physically or from Zoom. Uh, so welcome to the Nano in Medicine and Health lecture series, which is a joint effort between the Nano Medicine Lab here in Manchester and also the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology in Barcelona. As you all know, our seminar speaker for today, and it's a great pleasure to have him with us, is uh, Professor George Mangaras from the University of uh, Cambridge. But before welcoming Professor Mangaras for his keynote uh, lecture, I'm very happy to introduce you to one of our junior uh, researchers from the nano neuro team uh, of the nanomedicine lab, uh, Dr. Uh, Sam uh, Flaherty. And he will give us an introductory talk about graphene-based uh, transistor arrays in a post-drug uh, brain. So Sam, the floor is yours. Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming and to, to listen to us speak. So I'm investigating the post-stroke brain using graphene transistor arrays. Stroke is one of the largest contributors to, to mortality in the world, and 80% of strokes are ischemic. This isn't working. There we go. Termed focal cerebral ischemia. Focal cerebral ischemia is where you have a clot in a vessel in the brain that prevents oxygen, nutrients reaching this particular region of the brain. And this focal area turns the core is an area of dying tissue in which with time will die post as um, ischemic stroke you will find three defined regions so i mentioned the, the ischemic core which is the infarct where uh, the tissue is dying and the surrounding the core is the, what we call the penumbra this region has a restricted blood flow and this is the region that researchers are most keen on because surrounding the penumbra is the healthy tissue the penumbra the cause fate is decided in the healthy tissue is healthy tissue. However, the penumbra can either die, turn into the core, or can revert back to healthy tissue. So what researchers are trying to do is slow down this process or try and stop this process. What we're aiming to do is dynamically, in real time, in real time, is map the penumbra health, looking at electrophysiology responses of the tissue. One of the main phenomena we see post ischemic stroke, but you also see it within migraine with aura, you see it with epilepsy and traumatic brain injury, is what we call a spreading depolarization. This is a wave, a very slow wave, propagate, a slow propagating wave of, um, of depolarization and complete ionic breakdown across the cortex, as depicted on this image here. You have a velocity, a velocity of around three millimeters per minute um, and the, and the propag propagate across the cortex. We record brain signals and electrophysiology as, as shown in the, in the trace on the bottom left. I'll just put my laser pointer on. Here, these uh, brain signals, oscillations, can be broken down into what most people record is the local field potential. However, these spreading depolarizations occur at what we call direct current shifts. Now, these are very, very slow. They're not even oscillations, this is just a brain activity. Um, but what's interesting to know about these spreading depolarizations is the only damaged metabolically compromised tissue, such as the penumbra, which is why we're so keen on these. In terms of healthy tissue, the depolarization comes in, the tissue depolarizes, and then it recovers to normal, and everything resumes to how it, was, how it should be and how it was. And like I mentioned, spreading depolarizations are these ultra slow brain signals. So, how do we currently record these spreading depolarizations? Well, the sort of gold standard for these DC coupled recordings is the solution-filled micro glass electrodes that you implant in the brain and they um, passively record the brain signals. So here in the top left figure, this is the DC coupled trace. You see the depolarization from electrode one, and then you see the propagation because they're moving so slow that it comes from electrode one to electrode two. And you see the depolarization, depolarization following an electrode two sometime afterwards. But interestingly, you see suppression of your local field potential. This is just general brain activity. Brain activity is suppressed during this and after this spread and polarization. The issue is and why we need to look at new technologies to map these and to monitor these is because these glass electrodes are not ideal for preclinical awake recordings and they're not ideal for clinical recordings. We don't, we're not going to implant 
pass re electrodes into the brain. So what we've currently got in clinic are these platinum iridium electrode strips, which are very good. They can detect these spreading the polarizations. However, they do come with their own limitations. One of the main limitations is the fact that the intrinsic properties of the metals and the recording configuration can cause similar attenuation and distortion of these ultra slow signals. So they're spreading the polarizations. You also find that the signal drift, there's a lot of signal drift as shown here. This is a very large drift. This should be quite stable. And these do tend to drift outside of the amplifier range. So the operator has to offset and zero the signal. And then another strange, interesting thing is that the artifact within the signals, so here we have spreading the polarization, but right next to this spreading the polarization, we have a, just a strange artifact. However, when you then come to your analysis, this artifact looks exactly like spreading the polarization. So quite difficult to differentiate between the spreading the polarization and the artifact. So a common, an alternative to these commonly used passive electrodes are what we call field effect transistors, which are active transducers. And we're using these graphene solution gated field effect transistors. Works on the same, same principle as a field effect, transi field effect transistor. We have an electrical potential here, which we set the operator can control. And we have, which then feeds into the source. And we have an electrical potential at the drain point, which we call the drain voltage. But what's interesting is, the, is a current, we're recording current. It's a current that flows through the device. And we know the voltage at point B, at uh, point A, and we know the voltage at point B. And then we record from the electrolyte, in our case, the brain, because we're doing we're recording as vivo. We're recording the, um, the voltage coming from the brain, and this voltage then modulates the current that runs through the device. And there's then a fluctuation, a change of this current, and this changes what we record. And this is, um, so we initially record current, and then in post analysis, we can convert this back to voltage. The conductor we're using is graphene, in normal um, field, effect field effect transistors, it's a metal oxide. In here is graphene, that graphene is biocompatible. It's flexible and ultra thin. And interestingly, these um, arrays can have 16, 32, 64 um, operating channels, which is what we're using. However, our collaborators in Barcelona who have fabricated and designed these devices are, are working on arrays with hundreds to thousands of these channels, which will really improve our, our, our uh, special mapping. So how does this compare to the so the devices I showed earlier. So we see that there's no signal drift when, we, when we're recording the same traces, the same spreading polarizations. And interestingly, there's no signal attenuation or distortion, which I, I mentioned earlier <coughs> with the platinum iridium electrode. And we confirm, we confirm this by recording the same depolarization with what we've referred to as the gold standard. So if we come, we place the array and the microelectrode next to each other, we record the same spreading polarization and it has the exact same waveform, the same amplitude. And we now have a technology which we can combine both the advantages of platinum iridium and advantages of the gold standard um, glass microelectrode. And we now have a device that can record with very high fidelity, can also map. So I'm using this technology in a stroke model, specifically the photothrombotic stroke, to then map how uh, they spread in the polarizations from the ischemic, uh, from the number of propagate across the tissue. The photophrombotic stroke model is very simple. It's an RP injection of, of Rose Bengal. You don't irradiate the skull in the, re, in the area you want to cause the stroke with a, with a laser of a very particular wavelength. This then induces the cerebral ischemia. The reason we're using stroke now, uh, not stroke, the reason we're using photophrombotic stroke at this stage is because we can control the experiment. We know exactly where we're irradiating. We can irradiate for longer if we want a larger ischemic infarct. Um, and we place the array within the, within the irradiation zone and we can place it outside. And this picture on the bottom right shows how this looks with the array on the, on the, on the dura, on the brain, and the laser just above. So this is some raw data and I wanted to keep the data raw so you see exactly what we see when we finish recording. And you can see here, this is, oh, let's keep that. This is 13 channels from a single transistor. So this is all recorded on the same array. This is a two-hour recording. You can see that the, the baseline is very stable. There's no, there's no drifting. The black trace is our DC couple. So this is where you see the spread in the polarization. And the ready pink trace is the local field potential that you can see. Post uh, irradiation, which is marked by this uh, artifact within the LFP trace, you see you're spreading the polarization with propagation through the channels. And then you also see your LFP activity suppression, which are the two biomarkers that confirm the spread of the polarization. 
I also saw confirmation of stroke. Some people use TT staining. We can simply just see, depending on the polarization, this is our confirmation of stroke. And you also see this again. So the second CS, uh, spreading the polarization you see is spontaneous. Um, that's what caused by the stroke. It's spontaneous due to just tissue damage and uh, depicts the tissue health. So I mentioned that we're trying to map. Now, this is the array in the brain. And in a second, I'm going to play this video here. And you'll see, so this is where we've um, induced the infarct. This is where we've induced the infarct here. And the spreading and the polarization will come from the infarct across the array, underneath the array. And here you'll see some hyperpolarization, which is depicted by a red color, and then the depolarization, which is depicted by a blue color. And we're recording from this. These two traces are from this channel here in blue, this channel here in blue here. And you'll see in a moment the red hyperpolarization, and then you see the depolarization come across the array surface, which is then, if we look at the actual, what it's like in real life, this is the insult here. And then this, this circle here is here, and you see how the depolarization comes across the array. Um, underneath the array. Now, interestingly, these uh, transistors are also compatible with many imaging techniques, calcium imaging, MRI, but more interestingly for my work in stroke is we're all very keen on looking at blood flow around stroke. And the way we measure blood flow, or we'll look at blood flow is using laser spectral contrast imaging. In the top left, you can see the array on the brain. But if you look at the pseudo um, laser speckle video, uh, movie picture, you can see that the array is completely invisible and we can image through the array. So now I've spoken about the electrophysiology and then I've spoken about the blood flow. If we combine them, we can start to tell the bigger story around this. Um, so look, look at the bigger picture around this story. So blood flow post an ischemic stroke or post stroke is very complex and it's dependent on which region you're in, whether you're in the core, the number or the health of tissue. Here is a graph that looks at cerebral blood flow during the CSD that's propagated from the number. The closer you are to the core, you see vasoconstriction and then no return to baseline, depicting that this tissue is on the verge of death and it will turn into core tissue. As you move towards the healthy tissue, you see just vasodilation, which recovers to baseline. I mentioned earlier that healthy tissue is not damaged by spreading the polarizations. It simply lets the, the polarization pass and um, recovers to normal. But if you look at just a single vessel, this is the array above, placed above a single vessel, you see as the depolarization occurs, you see this vasoconstriction of the vessel, and then once we see the uh, the tissue repolarize, the vessel um, blood flow returns to, to normal. And here we can sort of predict because there's no vaso, uh, there's no hyperemia here. We can predict we're in the uh, C band here, for example. Now I've shown you a vessel up close, but how do these look if you map from a large uh, a larger um, field of view. So this is the midline of the animal. Um, so the major vessels run down the midline. You have the array here, completely invisible. This is the optic fiber, which five minutes post what you're about to see irradiated in this region. This is the array tail, and this is played very fast. This is six second video, so pay attention because it does pass really quickly. What you're gonna see is a blue shadow, dark blue, depicting reduction in blood flow spread from here. Down, it does go underneath the array, although it doesn't look like it does, it does, and it comes here which is then followed by hyperemia, and you'll see an increased level of blood flow. This is the spreading the polarization in real time. This is how it looks. So we're trying to map how this is spreading across the cortex. So I hope that was, wasn't too fast. So conclusions of this work. Uh, the graphene solution gated field effect transistors are a very useful tool to map these electrographic responses and further understand the brain because we can look at both local field potentials and ultra slow and DC coupled recordings. It's clear that these spreading depolarizations do disrupt blood flow, post ischemic stroke. And I've mentioned that the penumbra is very vulnerable. It can turn into the core or it can revert back to healthy tissue. These spreading depolarizations are incredibly energy dependent. They require so much energy. This penumbra has already restricted blood flow. It doesn't have much energy. It'd be like me asking you to go for a 30 minute run and then when you come on do a two minute sprint, the tissue would likely die because of this depolarization. So our aim is to dynamically map how this penumbra grows, how it behaves and, and look at the tissue health. And then further projects, we can look at how we can evaluate the efficacy of therapeutic agents and also monitor the stroke severity. Then looking further ahead, we can map the electrophysiology uh, post the ischemic stroke with a larger array. I've mentioned that it's very complex. It depends on which region you're in. At the moment, we can only be in two of the regions, whereas if we had a larger array, we could be within the core, the penumbra and the healthy tissue, we can map 
exactly how all these fell into biosations across the tissue. And then moving further forward to chronic away head fix, we can overcome the limitations of anesthesia and we can just recover for much more uh, longer lengths of time. And some acknowledgements for quite a few people on here. So I'd like to thank the people in Barcelona for both designing and fabricating these, these, these uh, devices. People I work with in contact on the day to day basis is Eddie and Anton. Thank you very much. And then of course, the Nano Medicine Lab, Professor Costas. And then there's also the big group, Professor Stuart Allen, and then uh, my leader, Rob White, and my team, Ahmed and Kate, and then the Nano Medicine Lab members as a, as a whole. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Sam. Very nice talk. So, do we have any questions from the audience here in Manchester? Yes, this is really amazing uh, work, really incredible. Where do you go from here? So, our next step, interestingly, so the photophrobotic model is very good because we can control its parameters. However, the penumbra region is quite small. Actually, it's probably non-existent, very, very fine. So the next step is to look at more clinically relevant. I recently learned the um, MCA or distal ferrochloride model, which is probably more clinically relevant, but we need to understand how the tissue behaves in a very controlled environment. And then we can look at less controlled environments, which is a ferrochloride model and see how the tissue behaves. So that's the next step. And then the every larger arrays I've mentioned, Edu and Anton are already in the process of fabricating these, and we hope to have them in the new year. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question from the audience? No. So let's thank Sam one more time for this little talk. And now it is a great honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Professor George Mandaras. Uh, who is a Principal Professor of Technology at the University of Cambridge. He received his PhD from the University of Groningen and then he moved to US for his postdoc at the IBM Almaden Research Center. Before joining Cambridge, he was a faculty member at the Cornell University where he was a director of the nanoscale facility and then he moved to France at the School of Mines. His research has been recognized with many awards, including the New York Academy of Science, the US National Science Foundation in DuPont, and an honorary doctorate from the University of Lingobing in Sweden. He is a fellow of the Materials Research Society and of the Royal Society of Chemistry, and serves as a deputy editor of Science Advances. He is considered an international leader uh, in the field of bioelectronic medicine, and his talk today will focus on new electronic materials and devices engineered for electrical uh, stimulation. Great. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you for having me here. Perfect. Great. <laughs> so thank you for having me. The honor and pleasure, it's all mine. And it's great to be talking to a live audience. This is, it has been a long time. This is the first talk uh, post uh, lockdown in live audience. It's a great pleasure to be here. So we'll talk about technology for bioelectronic medicine. I'll give you uh, my, my view of what bioelectronic medicine is and why it needs new technology. We saw a beautiful example uh, just before uh, this talk and I'll, I'll build and follow uh, up on that. So let me start with what medicine is. And this is the engineer's view of, uh, of you know, the field. So what is medicine? Um, the way I see it is we get born and start our journey through life, the length of which is mostly determined by our genetic makeup. But there are factors that can speed up that journey. For example, a poor lifestyle, uh, pathogens, which are very much a la mode these days, accidents can reduce your transit on this planet. In this context, medicine is a decelerator. It helps buy you more time here. It's a set of know-how and technologies that we developed as, a, uh, as humankind to give us more time and more quality time on this earth. So let's see what that entails. What are the modes of intervention? The most common one is probably pharmaceuticals. Um, 
And this can be used for prevention. Again, vaccines very much a la mode these days can be used to control symptoms, such as the uh, administration of dopamine on, on Parkinson's patients. It doesn't solve, it doesn't cure the disease, but it controls, helps control the symptoms. Or it could be curative. If there is a bacterial infection, antibiotics can help cure that. Another traditional mode of intervention is surgery radiotherapy. This is where you, you address, in a sense, the uh, uh, getting in and cutting and rewiring and burning. It's mostly subtractive if you see it as a, as a process. Um, again, examples from uh, prevention, such as prophylactic mastectomy in people who are at risk of uh, breast cancer. Um, symptom control, such as installing a shunt between the, the, the cerebrospinal fluid and the abdominal to drain into the abdominal cavity for a hydrocephalus and curative uh, resection of tumor. If you get the whole tumor before it metastasizes, that's, uh, you get a curative outcome. So these are more like the classical modes of intervention. I'm very excited about some modern ones. For example, regenerative medicine. We saw uh, today a tour of the, the Royce Institute. They're doing amazing work with um, materials for this new uh, branch of medicine. And here I'm more excited about the, the curative aspects of this technology, uh, such as, for example, when you inject stem cells in uh, uh, patients with uh, leukemia. In this vein, bioelectronic medicine is also a new technology, a new modality that we have uh, developed and can be used for prevention. Um, I don't know how many of you are in football. You're certainly in a great place for that with two uh, top tier teams. This was from last summer. There was the Euro uh, taking place and one of the footballers from the uh, Denmark's national team collapsed on the field because he suffered the cardiac arrest. So he was fitted then with this device, which is an implantable cardioverter defibrillator that has electrodes placed on the heart that monitor the beating of the heart. And if the heart stops, if there's cardiac arrest, then it's gonna give it a good pulse and um, uh, defibrillate the, uh, the patient. So it's there to prevent death. Having said that, by and large, the um, largest application of bioelectronic medicine today is for symptom control. One example is deep brain stimulation, which is used to uh, treat uh, motor uh, uh, diseases, disorders, um, such as dystonia, Parkinson's, and tremor, as is the example here you would implant electrodes uh, deep in the brain, typically in the subthalamic nucleus, and through stimulation with uh, current pulses, you would ameliorate the symptoms shown here with a flick of a switch. So you go from not being able to hold a glass of water to being able to function almost normally. This has also been used in epilepsy to um, reduce the severity and frequency of seizures. Um, is being used in neuropsychiatric disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, is being used for treatment of obesity, and the gamut is expanding. Um, arguably, this whole started, this whole field started uh, by the work of Luigi Galvani in the 18th century, the famous experiment where you apply an electrical potential to the uh, legs of a dead frog and you get them to twitch. This started the whole discussion of the structure of the neuromuscular uh, system. And then 200 years later, there were medical applications. This is a pacemaker about the year before this device became fully implanted. At that time, uh, the um, electronics and the battery were external. So this patient was tethered to that, that cart. And fast forward to today, these devices have been miniaturized and can be placed inside the heart using a very simple uh, operation. Uh, so incredible progress since the, uh, the first discovery of the phenomenon of bioelectricity. Uh, a bit of a timeline for bioelectronic medicine. Again, in terms of uh, the first fully implanted device was the, uh, the pacemaker for uh, treating arrhythmias. Late 50s was the first implantation. Today, fairly standard 
procedure that benefits over 600,000 patients per, per year. A decade later, cochlear implants for treating uh, people with severe uh, forms of deafness um, implanted in the inner ear. Um, again, a fairly standard device these days. Then a decade later, we had spinal cord stimulation. We'll, we'll talk about this uh, today for uh, treating chronic pain. A couple of other devices. Then the brain came to the forefront in early 2000s with deep brain stimulation for uh, neurological and neuropsychiatric disorders uh, and many more devices, not a comprehensive chart. Most recently, we've been having uh, a, an expansion in the gamut of what can be treated with this uh, concept to autoimmune uh, uh, disease, for example, type one diabetes, Crohn's disease, um, are believed to be treatable with this uh, concept. So very exciting time. So exciting that even companies you wouldn't associate with uh, bioelectronic medicine are jumping in. This is Alphabet, which is Google's parent company. They teamed up with a pharmaceutical a couple of years ago to launch Galvani Bioelectronics here in the UK. And they have a vision of replacing, uh, you know, traditional pharmaceuticals as we know them with miniaturized electrical stimulation that tickle the peripheral nervous system. And since then, you know, the um, team behind uh, SpaceX and Tesla and uh, team behind Facebook are also getting into this uh, game. There's a lot of hype. Every time you see a, a Hollywood movie with some bioelectronics uh, concept. It's, it's the evil guy who wants to uh, destroy the universe as we know it. On the right hand side on your screen, left hand side on your screen, you see uh, a, a boy who's hearing for the first time thank to, thanks to cochlear implant. So this is a device that's implanted in the inner ear that receives information from this external part that picks up sound, uh, processes it, and then with this uh, coil radios it inside the brain. And look at the marvel in his eyes as he gets this new perception for the first, first time. Like any medical technology does cause ethical issues. This is from a very funny movie. I don't know if you, you've seen it. It's called Young Frankenstein. It's, it's really hilarious. And it's the quintessential mad scientist trying to galvanize, as it was called at the time, or reanimate a dead corpse. Obviously something that's not wasn't ethical accept, ethically acceptable then or now. And this caused harm in the field. For about 50 years, there was a hiatus in bioelectronics development research. With, through collaboration with society and through an open dialogue, then devices like this cardioverted defibrillator were finally developed. So it's very important that that avenue of communication with society stays open and all the research is in the open um, in the context of responsible innovation. So much more significant ethical issues are raised when we're acting on the seat of consciousness, the seat of self. And I can talk about that if, more if you have any questions. So with that as an introduction, let's look at the limitations. So what's the catch? This is all too exciting. Why don't we see that patients deployed uh, to patients at scale? There are some formidable limitations. First and foremost, we do not understand how the brain works. It's a very complex machine consisting of over 80 billion neurons. And although we understand in a quantitative manner how neurons communicate with each other uh, through the uh, you know, accumulation of inputs uh, uh, from their dendrites, compilation of this input at the axon hillock, the generation of the uh, action potential um, that travels down the axon um, causes ions to go in and out of the cell membrane. Um, when it arrives at the synapse, it causes the release of neurotransmitter that can either inhibit or excite the postsynaptic neurons. These are cellular phenomena that we understand on a quantitative basis. We do not understand how we go from this to microscopic behavior. Um, in order to do that, electrophysiologists are using electrodes at different spatial scales from implantable ones that can measure single neurons to 
cortical ones that typically measure larger uh, assemblies to um, uh, cutaneous ones that measure even more average deformation to try and join the dots of how you go from this phenomena to behavior. The opposite is also not understood how you uh, change behavior, why you change behavior when you stimulate with an electrode in, in a brain region. Now, these fundamental limitations come hand in hand with some severe technological limitations that we will examine today in this talk. So um, let me start with the, the, the first one in a moment. But before going there, let me give you the, uh, the conclusion of the talk. And the conclusion is it's good to be a technologist in this field. This is a field that is defined by and limited by technology and any advances in technology um, will translate into a better understanding of how the brain works and into new treatments becoming available. Again, the talk before me was a beautiful demonstration of how you go from a, a, a transistor to understanding what happens in, uh, when you have a stroke. So let's start looking at this uh, uh, limitation. It's a little bit like peeling an onion. You, you, peel off one layer, then there's yet another one to peel off. And you think, okay, that's the end of it. And then you peel it off and there's yet another one. So um, we'll go through a couple of the steps. And we haven't seen the end of it yet. So tissues are soft and they move. The brain is jello-like, it jiggles inside the skull when we walk about. Um, it pulsates due to blood flow and you're trying to make a good mechanical contact to this moving target. Here I will cite work uh, done over a decade ago by, uh, uh, by John Rogers. At that time, he was at Illinois, now at Northwestern, who developed very flexible and conformal um, uh, cortical arrays. This is the brain of a cat. And as you see, it's not flat. Human brain is even more topographically complex, has sulci into which you want to, to go with your technology. So you need to have electronics that go beyond the typical wafer form that we're familiar with into a very conformal um, uh, form. Um, and this is work that was done, again, about a decade ago. By that time, it was, at that time, it was really uh, enabling a novel. So what John did is they used very thin uh, polymer uh, substrates to develop their electronics on. So thin that they couldn't support their own weight. So if you were to lift this array up from the wafer onto which it was fabricated, it would crumple under its weight. So they came up with a way to use a silk uh, fibroid to, um, in a sense, give it some extra mechanical strength, be able to pick it up late on the brain and then dissolve the silk with um, uh, with a saline solution and achieve a tattoo-like conformability um, uh, with, with the brain. So this allowed them to uh, record from different brain regions um, um, and start mapping the brain at higher resolution than available before. This was taken a step further a couple of years later by the group of Stephanie Lacour at that time at EPFL who developed electronics now on stretchable, not only conformal, but also mechanically stretchable materials. They used uh, uh, rubbery materials such as silicones that will follow the motions of the body, for example, on the spinal cord. Um, uh, as the animal or the human behaves, uh, the, the spinal column will change shape, and these technologies is able to follow that. So these are just two examples of the work that went in into addressing the soft and moving target nature of, uh, of the brain. And there are many other approaches there. Um, so I would claim that the, the mechanics of the contact have been addressed to a decent uh, extent. Um, the next layer in that onion is to be able to measure signals that are small and diverse. By small, I mean small in amplitude. When a neuron fires, you'll have a current uh, in the electrolyte 
uh, because of ions going in and out of the membrane, because of uh, the process of cytosis of neurotransmitter, because of many other phenomena. But this is just a very small wave on top of a very deep ocean uh, in the electrolyte. So being able to tease that information out is, is tricky. And you're also looking at diverse signals. You're looking at ions, you're looking at neurotransmitters, you're looking at uh, uh, even components of cells getting exchanged. So you need to develop multiple techniques to query this phenomenon. So here I'll, I'll cite some work from my previous group where we took materials that are called organic mixed conductors as a way to couple better to ionic signals in the brain. And the argument goes as follows. When neurons fire, ions in the cerebrospinal fluid are put into motion, responding to the electrical activity uh, of neurons. So these uh, ions uh, basically uh, respond to the spatiotemporal summation of activities in their proximity. And as they um, uh, wiggle about their equilibrium position, if you present a piece of uh, electronic material, let's say a, a, a chunk of silicon wafer, electronic charges in that wafer will mirror that motion. They will couple electrostatically and mirror that motion. And then you measure the displacement current that results from that. And that's how you know that neurons have fired. Um, doing that with silicon doesn't really work. It's not a very effective way to do this. You have this insulator, an oxide or a nitride that, that spaces out the ionic and the electronic carrier and decreases their interaction. That's why people use things such as platinum as electrodes. But in that case, despite the fact that you have proximal interaction between the ionic and electronic carriers, it's still a two-dimensional interaction. They couple along a two-dimensional surface. And as a result, their interaction is quite modest. If you use materials in which ions can penetrate into the volume, and this is an example from a conducting polymer called P.PSS, we're not going to go into details of chemical structures here. Imagine this being like a sponge where ions from the cerebrospinal fluid will penetrate and ions can penetrate as well. And then when they're set in motion, they couple in a volumetric fashion with electronic charges. This increases the strength of interaction between ionics and electronics and helps you make devices that operate with state-of-the-art performance. The um, signature of this phenomenon is a capacitance that scales with the thickness of your electrode. So the thicker you make your electrode, the more volume you present for interaction between ionic and electronic carriers, the higher the capacitance. So if you just have a film of this polymer that's 130 nanometers thick, you can increase capacity, you can increase the coupling by two orders of magnitude. Now this allows you to then shrink down your electrode by two orders of magnitude and still maintain a good signal to noise ratio. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you just gained in spatial resolution. And this is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is what is shown here. We um, made this microelectrodes, um, again, the size of tens of microns uh, using this uh, polymer coating and integrated them with thin flexible substrates that follow the mechanics, the, the topography of the brain and give us good mechanical contact. So with this, we can conform to uh, surfaces that are curvilinear, shown here on, a, on an orchid leaf. And because they're so small, they can record information with very high spatial uh, uh, resolution. Shown here are uh, single neural recordings from the cortex of a rat. And again, this, it was the first time that this was uh, uh, reported simply because it was the first time that a cortical electrode was made with such a, a, a small resolution. And this technology was deemed to be uh, uh, significant so that it was translated to humans. 
and it's used now in clinics to map the human brain at exceptionally high resolution. So this is already a couple of years ago. Where do we go with this? Is to introduce multimodality. So this can be made transparent and maintain a very uh, uh, high capacitance so you can get good recordings of single neuron activity as, as shown here. But at the same time, you can shine a powerful laser through them and then do super resolution microscopy such as shown here. This is a, a technique called structure illumination microscopy where you can now combine the uh, temporal resolution of electrophysiology with exceptional spatial resolution endowed by this super resolution uh, optical techniques. You can see uh, um, molecular type of markers uh, loc located at the, at the synapse um, area between two neurons. And at the same time, you can also expand this towards other imaging modalities such as MRI. Um, with a little bit of work, you can make those MRI compatible and start doing uh, uh, structural and functional work. Um, again, being able to bring together multiple techniques to get a better understanding of how the, the, the brain works. So again, there are many more things to do here on this front, but uh, there is a significant progress being made in the last decade or so. Let me address now the another issue, which is the fact that bioelectronics as practiced today is highly invasive. Um, this will do in the context of spinal cord stimulation. This is an established neuromodulation technique that is being used to help people with, uh, who suffer from chronic pain. And the idea is if you stimulate with electrodes that are implanted on the spinal cord, then you can uh, uh, replace the painful sensation um, with a, a more agreeable tingling-like uh, sensation. There are two technologies here. One involves the so-called uh, paddle electrodes that are two-dimensional arrays. To place those on the spinal cord, you need a laminectomy. You need to remove part of the vertebrae to open up space and slide those up the spinal column. And this is a, quite an invasive process that requires a lengthy stay at the hospital. Um, however, these electrodes work really well. They have multiple sites where you could stimulate, plus they, they provide directed stimulation into the spinal cord. So they're also quite efficient. An alternative technology is this percutaneous arrays that can be placed on the spinal cord through the space between vertebrae, shown here. Um, so they do not require a laminectomy. It, it takes place uh, by an outpatient procedure uh, such as a, a spinal tap, but they can fall off their target. They can shift through the body and lose efficacy altogether. Plus they're not very efficient to begin with because they only provide stimulation of a limited part of the spinal cord. And they, their three dimensional nature, the fact that the electrodes themselves are cylinders is quite wasteful uh, uh, energy wise. So here we got inspiration from the field of soft robotics. This is work from uh, George Whiteside's lab at Harvard, who used pneumatic actuation to make soft objects change shape. As a result here, you get crawling motion, but the big picture is that you can change the shape at will by using, uh, um, using pneumatics. So then it was a matter of just introducing microfluidics onto our flexible arrays to come up with devices that can be rolled up, then inserted on the spinal cord through the space between vertebrae, and then expanded with pneumatic actuation to become paddle electrodes. So this would give you the best of the two technologies, the facility of placement of a percutaneous array and the efficacy of the paddle. So this is the first iteration. This is a puddle which is modeled after a Medtronic uh, product. It can be rolled up into the shape of a percutaneous array. And if you design it right, then the, um, uh, the electrical characteristics do not change upon expansion. This is how it expands. 
in an in vitro uh, model of the spinal cord. I think this might be running out of battery. So um, this is how the, the device looks like. It has two uh, components. It's a fluidic component that's made out of a silicone. And then the electronics component is the, the one that I showed you on the neurogrid, the, the cortical array. So the idea here is that, again, you would roll it and it has to be smaller than uh, uh, two millimeters so it can go through a, a, a tube that goes through a two needle and, and can get uh, injected up the, the spinal cord. One of the design issues here um, was preventing expansion along the Z direction, which would push uh, onto the spinal cord, and that's certainly not des desirable. So through proper engineering of uh, uh, pinch points between the top and bottom side of the microfluidic, you can prevent that from happening and guide the pressure uh, laterally to get this unrolling uh, motion. And then it was a question of uh, developing the appropriate cadaveric model, human cadavers. And uh, through saline reconstitution, we could uh, recapitulate the anatomical features of a living body and test this device. So um, this is the insertion uh, through a needle. Again, with a, a, a fairly simple process, this device is injected into the spinal cord and then guided upwards. Here there is a fluoroscopy uh, set up that can, uh, a fluoroscope that can monitor the insertion and expansion of this device. And then you can pneumatically activate it manually or with a more complex uh, uh, equipment. So this is a device uh, being injected. There are two markers here at the top and bottom part of the device that initially coincide when the device is rolled up and then they uh, uh, separate when the device is uh, unrolled, shown here. And then you can go and do a laminectomy. So this is the injection uh, site. And then you do a laminectomy to look at the device and convince yourself that it conforms the way it should be. So this is now ready for first in human. And we hope to be able to launch into those in early 2022. Um, and hopefully one day this will make it to patients at, at scale. So let me now focus on the last uh, bit and show you some recent uh, data that are not uh, published yet on addressing the foreign body reaction, which is quite a tricky thing. So anytime you stick something into the brain, you uh, cause a, a reaction anywhere in the body, actually, you would, you would elicit a reaction in the brain. This results into the formation of a glial scar. And that insulates, in a sense, your device from the neural environment. When you stimulate, this means you need to spend more energy up your stimulation parameters to, to go through that scar into the tissue. When you're recording, you're a bit stuck because your source of signal just goes further and further away from your device. Uh, there are many approaches that have been tried to minimize this by making very thin, very flexible, devices by anchoring them with a very flexible tether on the skull so they don't cause an insult as the, the, the brain jiggles with the skull, by infusing them with uh, anti-inflammatory, with neurotrophins. And all these approaches have helped, but the problem still, still remains quite outstanding. One of the proposals out there, one of the concepts, is the so-called living electrode concept where you would have your electrode, you would coat it with a conducting polymer to decrease impedance, uh, enhance uh, transduction of neural signals, and then also coat it with a gel that contains uh, living cells that would either innervate the native tissue or get innervated by the native tissue. And in a sense, promote integration of your implants with the body. So you camouflage your implant behind living uh, uh, tissue to enhance integration. Um, this is very exciting because in a sense, it combines the two new modalities of inter intervention. 
you can get the curative outcomes of regenerative medicine combined with the control of bioelectronics. So we can start talking about regenerative bioelectronics as, a, as an interesting theme of research. Um, this goes a step beyond what you can do with traditional bioelectronics, where you have to work with whatever tissue is left behind, uh, often damaged by, by disease or trauma. Here you have the option, the opportunity to also think about repairing that tissue and then interacting with it with a bioelectronic device. One question is where do the cells come from? And here we rely on a collaboration with Mark Cotter and his company Beat Bio, who have developed a way to forward program uh, um, human pluripotent stem cells into different somatic type cells with a very simple process. So what you see in the video here is uh, iPSC derived uh, uh, cells that are converting to myocytes and then myotubes within just a couple of days through a, a, a simple process. So this is now commercially available. It's scalable, it's single step, it's virus free. It has all the advantages that, that you want um, for a technology that can be scaled up and, and used in um, this application. So to validate this, we work on a, a peripheral nerve injury model where we transect the uh, sciatic nerve and then present it with a device that has these myotubes uh, grown on it. So the idea here is um, if, if you don't have this uh, device, if you don't present this device, these axons of the, the motor neurons will clump together and form a neuroma. Um, and the idea is that if you present them with muscles, then they will innervate those muscles. Um, information coming from the brain will come down these uh, axons and trigger muscular activity. So when you're recording here, you're gonna record EMG signals, but these are signals that originate from the brain and it was information that was on its way to uh, uh, the muscle, which is now being disconnected uh, because of injury. So this is how the device looks like. Um, it, it maps nicely, has multiple electrodes maps nicely along the uh, different parts of the nerve. And um, this is the protocol. So we would culture this iPSCs on the, the device, start the differentiation process on day two. Uh, day eight, we already have mature uh, myotubes and then implant and let it integrate. And it takes a couple of, of days for that where we, we test it. So this is, uh, uh, first data on uh, histology, and we use uh, uh, an antibody here to, to stain and look at the cells that seem to survive very, very nicely this implantation process. And more exciting is the, uh, the functional data. Again, these are recordings from animals that show that Week one, we uh, post implantation, we don't yet have the innervation. You cannot record any signals from the device. But a couple of weeks later, then you can record myograms from the uh, 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 from the cells that got reinnervated um, on the device. So very exciting data. Uh, long way to go, obviously, for uh, translation. Uh, but we're already beginning to get glimpses of a future where you can combine regenerative medicine and bioelectronics uh, to do really things that are beyond uh, the, the reach of each individual field. So with that, let me start summing up. Uh, I hope I conveyed my enthusiasm about bioelectronic medicine as a new modality that we as humankind have developed to prevent disease and treat uh, uh, symptoms. The main technological challenge that remains outstanding is to establish a stable and effective interface between electronics and tissue. These are two different worlds and we need to bring them together. Um, I believe that action is it interfaces, the, the most beautiful research, the most fruitful research is it interfaces between two fields. The interface with soft robotics 
Um, I, I talked about this in the context of spinal cords, showed you an implant that can expand through pneumatic actuation. The same can happen on the brain. You can deploy a large cortical grid through a small bear hole. Um, you can think of devices that move inside the body and self-implant and change targets uh, uh, during the life of the patient and so on. Very exciting things to look forward to. And likewise, the interface with regenerative medicine paves the way towards curative outcomes. This uh, hybrid interfaces will, I'm convinced, will play a big role uh, in, in medicine. Then you can think about interface with synthetic biology and so on and so forth. Um, very fruitful uh, way of thinking. So let me thank the people who uh, contribute to this work. The lab is co-led by a neurosurgeon, Damiano Barone, who guides, provides the, uh, the clinical pull to our technology push. A um, couple of neurosurgeons that, that also helped was uh, Jiang Lei, a spinal cord surgeon, um, Sam Hilton and Alex uh, Carnisser, they did the, uh, the animal work, and the rest are engineers, Vincenzo, Ben, Sagnik, and Amy. Collaboration with Chris Proctor from uh, uh, engineering, Gabi Kaminsky uh, on the super resolution microscopy, and Mark Cotter on the cells. And these are the funding agencies. Vision without funding is hallucination, as my good friend Gordon Wallace uh, says. Um, so we're thankful to this organization for allow us to go from hallucinations to, to real devices. Thank you for having me here. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm ready to take questions. George, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, can you stand over there to respond to mm -hmm. questions? Can I also remind the Zoom audience that you can write your questions or, uh, in the chat? So, any questions from the audience here? Yes, Sam. Thank you very much. For the wonderful talk. I really like your. Um, your intervention of combining cells with the device. So, on this, a question I have was regarding the so the devices are implanted, but obviously they need an electrical point, so like a battery or a terrain. So, how are you going to approach this? Are you going to have a really one large battery? Are you going to have a rechargeable one? In looking at a human implantation. Mm -hmm. So the. Um... The uh, concept of uh, uh, brain-computer interface bypass in this particular context would be you have a, a, a nerve that's injured or a spinal cord that's injured, you would put an array uh, at the proximal to the brain and record information there. You're going to present with muscle so that you get the innervation, record the signals, process them, um, and then feed them to a device that would have nerves, uh, nerve cells that will innervate the muscle through the nerve conduit. This, this is the part that I didn't uh, show. I showed only the, the, the proximal to the brain part. Um, and eventually the computer will be implantable, implanted with power and all that. Um, there is an, a missed opportunity here. The fact that the muscle acts as a biological amplifier, the signals that we record are massive, massive. So the question is, can you condition this muscle recording the CMG signals with passive only electronics so that you can trigger neural activity in your, uh, the, the second device? So that would avoid having to deal with a battery, having to deal with active electronics I think it would be a, it is possible given the size of the signal. It's just a matter of figuring out what's the easiest form that you can massage this data into and feed them to muscle to, uh, to stimulate, to nerves to stimulate them. And then one more sort of, sorry, one more sort of broad question is do you see an end point where we become too? Too advanced almost, where we'll, we'll oh, okay, this organ's failing, we'll just implant them with a stimulator to the point where humans are just every, every organ, every muscle requires a stimulator. Do you feel that this, it could be an endpoint? 
are we to stop innovating? <laughs> I mean, if there is a thing like this, it would be way down the future. We still, the biggest limitation is that we don't understand how all this works. So it, it goes hand in hand when we develop new technology. Not only we pave the way for immediate interventions, but also more importantly, we pave the way for better understanding of how it works. And through this closed loop, um, will will advance. And I think it's a couple of generations before we reach the end of it. But you always have to, when you develop technology, you always have to keep an eye on when do you get into the game of diminishing returns. I yeah. think this is far away. We, we won't have to, to worry about this for another generation or two. Thank you so much uh, Thank you. for an amazing presentation. I have a also a question related to Sam's question uh, regarding the uh, regenerative, the regenerative electronic uh, mm -hmm. recording device. So I might have missed it. I'm not sure how the device looks like um, and whether you implant it directly on the nerve and why if you do that, why is it that the device itself has myo myself uh, embedded in it? So, yeah. I might have missed that. No, so the, the device uh, is a very flexible array onto which we culture uh, these myotubes. And then we just butt it on the uh, nerve stump. And there's a suture that just holds it in place. And then the electronics are tunneled under the skin and a little hat up in the head so you can connect it. Um, so the reason why we're presenting muscle is because we transected the, the nerve and you have now these axons descending from motor neurons that are looking for muscle to re-innervate. So it made sense to present muscle there. If you apply the same concept, for example, uh, on the brain after traumatic brain injury, you wouldn't put muscle there. You would put the appropriate type of neuron for the location where you're uh, Implanting. Well, maybe why not implant um, nerve, uh, nerve cells in order for um, yeah. uh, any uh, substances that would promote the growth of multi neurons or axon regeneration? That's the answer. Yeah. So uh, uh, on the other side of the injury, that's where we're presenting devices with motor neurons. And the idea is that this goes through the conduit and reinnervate the muscle. And, and provide acetylcholine at that, uh, uh, that junction. But here, when you have motor neuron actions descending, they're looking for muscle to connect to. So that's what it makes sense to give them. I think there is one question on Zoom, but before we go to the Zoom questions, there is one more question from the audience. Thank you, Professor Mario. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you. My question is again about the regenerative electrodes. Do you see a, um, you mentioned maybe a cause into a, well, promote them to generate nerve like cells to bring it and them into the brain? Do you see this as a solution to glial scarring? And when you, if you were to maybe solve glial scarring in general, what do you think that opens up? I mean, that, that is the hope. Um, but we, at this point, we don't have enough data to, to, uh, to convince ourselves that this, this is happening. I mean, we certainly hope so. That's why we started this work. Um, so where, where does this go is a very good question. We're only scratching the surface. Um, we just take a gel, just drop a bunch of cells in there and present that mess into the, to the body. Eventually, you want to go to more organized forms of the tissue engineered construct. And not only that, but you want to use the bioelectronics behind it to control the integration with the body. So experiments now focus on um, introducing the appropriate electrical and chemical stimuli to enhance integration and to also guide it spatially. Experiments like that have been performed before, for example, electrical stimulation to enhance um, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, sprouting of uh, neurites 
has been explored in starting in the early 90s with work of uh, Christine Schmidt at Langer's lab. Um, and then Gordon Wallace at, at Wollongong has done a lot of work of electrical and chemical stimulation to enhance connection of neurons uh, across an injury. So we hope to, to leverage all that in vivo. Um, and the fact that you have a, a, an electrode array that is spatially arranged uh, in a 2D fashion should be able to help you to convince this neural construct to throw actions that way as opposed to that way. Um, so hoping to be able to guide the interaction, the, the, this innervation. Um, I think it's a bit too early now to make a call and say, where would you like to go with this in terms of disease uh, uh, context? Um, down the road, you know, you would try to target diseases where you lose tissue, for example, traumatic brain injury, um, further down into the future, much more ambitious to look at things such as dementia that cause large and extensive damage. But again, very early in the game to, to be getting excited about that. Do you feel that when you're trying to access the areas of the brain that can look at that there's challenges in terms of the application on the surgical side? Um, do you think there are areas of the brain which you'd really like to be able to get to, but with your devices, but you find that it's quite actually difficult to access in the first place? Yes, yeah, yes, definitely. And that's why I'm very excited about the, the previous thing that I talked about, the uh, uh, little robots that can find the target in the brain so that that can free your hands rather than have to uh, design a, a straight trajectory to your target. Um, they can come maybe even from inside the, the, the body and find their way to the target following complex but minimally invasive pathways. Amazing. Again, they, you know, not something that we have in the lab today, but we can certainly see a path to follow to get there. Thank you. So one question from our Zoom audience. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a, a question from Robert Ho, and I hope I'll be able to paraphrase this correctly. Uh, he's got an interesting question for you. Um, at the start of your talk, you were talking about longevity of devices and implants, mm -hmm. but of course, if something goes wrong, you would need to go in and remove that implant. Mm -hmm. So his question is really around, again, the regenerative bioelectronics. And if your um, tissue is integrating fully with the other tissue, is that going to be a factor in if you need to explore the device? How would that, um, how would that work? Yes, absolutely. Certainly. It, it, so when you develop a drug, it's much more difficult to get it to the clinic because once you release it in the body, there's no way of collecting it out device typically has a shorter uh, path to, to the clinic because you can switch it off, you can explant it. With this concept, you're in a sense taking the device and pushing it closer to the other limit. So yes, uh, the, the, the reg regulatory aspects will be much more complicated because you won't be able to simply pull the device out. Okay. Any other questions? here from Manchester or um, from Zoom? If I may ask a question again, it seems most of your questions have come from the regenerative uh, area of and that's developed a lot of interest. So for my area, um, I, I am interested in epilepsy. And I, I was thinking if you're going to be using these IPS cells, you can genetically modify them presumably mm -hmm. before you put them back in. And you could make them capable, perhaps, of modern neurostimulation to release neuropeptides, yep. things that would decrease excitability. It's not only with your electro, could you record the seizure, but then you could use a, a bio cell mm. to release a therapeutic compound. Is, is that an area that might? Yes, definitely. And the fact that you can uh, modify them before you implant them uh, is also significant. Uh, so, yes, there are lots of possibilities to explore. 
it's a very exciting field. Um, and it will, it's just a bit like opening Pandora's box. The ideas are generated much, much faster than we can uh, pursue them. So hopefully other groups will join the, the field and it will uh, grow into its own uh, little thing. So if we don't have any other questions for Professor Mangaras, let's thank him one more time. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. you.